Hi, I'm glad you decided to stick around. I want to first off apologize for the audio quality. I tried to correct the background noises coming from my PlayStation, but that resulted into um, the audio from the game being a bit damaged. Uh, I will try and avoid that in the future and be more careful about the recording. And secondly, I it was my first time recording myself while playing something, and I feel like I didn't do a great job in explaining why I like the tutorial so much in terms of uh, how it introduced the mechanics. So I would like to spend a little bit of time going over that in a more um, in-depth and thorough manner. Um, and, all, and after that, going into the history and the, the cultural subtext and translation and that. So bear with me with a little while longer. So, what I find particularly interesting about the way the tutorial is set up is that beyond the overt prompts and pop-ups um, that explain the base mechanics of the game, there is a lot of stuff which is just implied and constructed through uh, the level design and the UI and the just the implied logic of the player as it interacts with the environment um, and I think that's really cool and well done. Um, I would have preferred more of that than the distracting pop-ups but I understand why they went for the, the safe route of just having those messages being very very evident and impossible to miss. Um, but there is a lot of the like, subtler stuff um, which is especially useful for players who are used to Soulspawn games in general. So starting off, you immediately begin the game unarmed and with very little health that um, immediately gives you a sense of avoiding danger is possible, which is already different from any other Soulspawn game. The second thing which is very important is the presence of presence of water nearby. You can immediately get into the water um, and learn that the water in this game is not an obstacle, it's an alternative way of moving around. You can swim and that is immediately communicated and exploring that rewards you with the knowledge of branching paths and the fact that you are going to come back in this part because there is a drop just out of reach. Um, and again, there is a very soulsborn thing to do, and it's good that they establish that immediately. It's one of the first things that you learn of the game. Um, then, when you Im when you get to experiment with the stealth mechanics, the way that they are introduced is that the second you turn that corner, you will be immediately in view, and then you are prompted at immediately hiding into the grass, and that gives you a hint of how. Uh, sensible, the discovery mechanics for the enemies, what the UI is like, and all of that. And even if the pop-ups makes it a little bit redundant, I really liked that you get to discover that in a way that gives the player pressure without it being, like, it, while still being very safe and it's very easy to hide. Um, then the way that the map is layout, you have the stealth path, the, the stealth path that you take to get into the tower without being discovered, and you see the rest of the map immediately, and there is no hard division between these two, it's a entirely a mechanical division of you are wounded and unarmed and any single strike will kill you, so you decide to follow the instruction and use the path um, that will make you stay safe, and that immediately imprints into the player the idea of finding the alternative road um, to avoid direct confrontation if, uh, if you want to, uh, which is then reinforced later when the way that the enemies are placed rewards the little path that I took, where instead of just running towards the gate with the four enemies, you can go to the right and stealth around a little bit to get a couple of kills without being confronted directly. Then. Uh, inside the moon viewing tower, there is the first hidden drop that immediately communicates the, that 
exploration will be rewarded by little extra stuff, and you get told implicitly by the fact that you sheath and unsheat the sword automatically when you leave uh, Kuro's side, that you cannot attack Kuro. Again, a big difference from other Soulsborne games, where this game will avoid you attacking certain characters. Um, you, there are going to be areas where you cannot commit any kind of violence, and most NPCs um, you will not be able to kill, even if you want to. Which is also communicated through the sword itself, when it says that a shinobi needs to know how to kill, but needs also to know uh, when to when to be merciful. Um, the way that the enemy, the tutorial for the the combat mechanics, the combat mechanics I will get to in later videos, um, but the way that these initial encounters are structured are a microcosm of the kind of encounters you will get from the um, the weak enemies at first, the larger number of enemies that you need to manage later, but that you can outsmart a little bit by using the environment to your advantage, the mini-bosses, later on the non-humans and animal enemies as well. It's all a little bit of a sample of everything that is going to be in the game. Um, the closed door that you cannot get to from this side is another clever nod to the classical Soulspawn thing of finding these kind of shortcuts in the future um, and immediately tell you that this is going to happen again, that this is going to be a normal part of the game. Um, and so is leaving that very conspicuous idol on the side, uh, which will be useful later. Um, and hints immediately at something else going on. And lastly, Genichiro's boss fight, I think, is, is an incredible boss fight, um, as it is entirely made of the fundamentals you've just learned, but also introduces new things in a way that makes it feel much more, like, overwhelming for you at this point in the game, but that it still is not unfair, it's just that you feel unprepared and weakened, which reflects how Wolf, as much as he has recovered his um, a reason to live, uh, really is not in his best shape. This is, he's, he has, is really out of it and cannot contend with an enemy of this level at this very moment. So yeah, all of that is implied in just how the level is constructed. I think that's, that's really smart and worth praising. So, having done all that game design stuff, I can now move forward first in presenting the historical context in which the game's story is set, um, or at least the fantasy interpretation of that historical context, uh, and then to the translation and cultural analysis of things like the dialogues and the objects and the, the items descriptions, uh, and so on and so forth, uh, that we saw in this first episode. So, the Sengoku period, or Warring State period, as I introduced during the video, was a period of Japanese history lasting from the Onin War of 1467 to the unification of Japan by Tokugawa Iyasu in 1615 and was a period where the centralized feudal system of Japan had collapsed and the land was therefore divided into countless clans constantly warring against each other. The Yashina historically were one of these clans, residing in the Matsu province of northern Japan uh, in a very mountain area of Japan in the Japanese Alps and they were fighting against the more famous Huezuki and Date clans. This latter was the one that finally destroyed them in 1589 during the Battle of Suryagehara. There are hints later uh, in the game that place the time frame as somewhere between 1596 and 1603, um, assuming that the, the historical facts of the rest of Japan are the same, of course. Um, so, in this fantasy version of Japan, it seems that Ashina survived much longer than their historical counterparts. Maybe because 
the Ashina of the game is one very focused on the fence and keeping the land more than expanding. Uh, I thought the confirmation that they are the same clan, even if, for example, as we see, the, the symbol is different um, than the historical one, is General Tamur, as introduced in the initial cutscene, as the Tamura family was a strong ally of the Date and fought alongside them against the Ashina. All of the information and more um, I took from a Reddit post by user Kira Taylor that I will leave in the description and kind of sent me into this historical rabbit hole, so I think that's a good introduction to that part of the game. So now let's start with the translation and cultural explanation. Um, in general, with all the translation have been held by a friend of mine uh, that goes by Zaj on the internet. I have provided a link to his Facebook in the description. He has been translating Japanese for some years now and is much, much better at the language than me. Um, most of the work I've done myself, but for the past they were a little bit too complicated for me. I asked for his help, so I think it's good to credit him for this. So, starting from the opening cutscene, the translation in general is very faithful and I generally really like the phrasing that they gave um, to, the, to the Japanese version, uh, but there are a couple of differences, especially new ones, with the introduction of Wolf's adoptive father. Um, that I feel more closely reflect the relationship. So, in English, the old shinobi sounds like he was intrigued by the desperate child and offers him to come with him as a result of that interest, uh, while in Japanese, at least to me, he sounds much more colder and detached than that. He doesn't say interesting, for one, and his phrasing is less of an offer and more of a statement, like so it seems like you want to follow me. Also, as an aside, the image of this young child gently grasping a blade like the finger of one of his parents, only for his end to be cut from this tender attempt at a connection is a, is a very powerful and telling one for me. Later on, the introduction to the Shinobi Codes is pretty much the same as far as the meaning goes, but feels less exposition-y in Japanese and more of an actual dialogue between these two, as the phrasing is something more like imprint deep into your heart the most important thing in your life, second only to your parents, and then the curtain, the, the sliding door is open. The one that from today will be your master, like as introducing the master to Wolf in a more organic way. So lastly, this line of the cutscene in Japanese actually doesn't mention anything about Kuro's age and just refers to him as Aruji, which means either master or lord. And this sets up a slower reveal for his identity than how it goes in English. I don't think this is a big deal, as it is resolved during the first half of the tutorial, and most people already knew about the boy from the trailers, but a hypothetical Japanese person who went into the game completely blind might have had very different expectations about Kuro. Like, the opening cutscene introduces us to Wolf saving a master without any other description. Then we get the letter that just reveals that his name is Kuro. Then, during the eavesdrop, the first eavesdrop dialogue, we know that he's called the Divine Hair, and also we discover that he's just a young boy, and then we finally see him and get to know him for the first time inside the Moon Viewing Tower, and by that point it is possible that we had a very different image of him in mind. So, moving on to our first item, the Ornamental Letter whose name in Japanese is quite different, as it is called the Japanese Iris Letter, or the Hanoshugu. The Japanese Iris as a flower has a meaning, a multiple meanings. It can mean 
gentle heart, elegance and good news and is also connected to the purification of evil energies in Japanese folklore. I believe that all of this meaning actually applied to this letter because the gentle heart and elegance are, as we will see later, a little spoiler, reflect on the nature of the woman who dropped it. Um, it is a carrier of good news for Wolf and it has an effect of shaking him out of his reverie and dispelling kind of the, the negative forces, we might say, that kept him being this drag of a person up until this point, so it's all very fitting. Also inside the description we discover Kuro's name, um, which in Japanese um, it's the meaning of its kanji is just ninth son, it was a very common name for the ninth son of a family. And just a, a minor detail, but the tone in which the actual letter is written in Japanese is much more formal and um, not exactly subservient, but demure, I would say, than in English. Next, as I hinted at doing the video, both the Moon View in Tower, or Tsukimi Yagura in Japanese, and the, res the Reservoir, or Mizuno Tekuruwa, that's, that's a mouthful, uh, were actual features that some Japanese castle possessed. The first one, the Moon Viewing Tower, was a particularly open tower, which was usually separated from the main structure and used for observing the landscape and to celebrate the Tsukimi Festival, which are a form of summer festivals that I've uh, I put more description into the video description. Um, the, the second, the reservoir, as I mentioned previously, was an area present in castles that did not have access to natural wells or rivers, or did not have enough access to them, as so as to provide drinkable water during sieges. And as we see in the game, that the reservoir does not seem to be exactly brimming with water, it kind of drives home once again how much under attack Ashina seems to be on a normal basis. So now we reach the second cutscene, the meeting between Wolves and Kuro. The translation here is generally pretty accurate and I like how they give Kuros the same level of like noble language that you use just normally, uh, both in Japanese and in English. Uh, but there is one major difference uh, in a sentence that is not... It doesn't change the meaning of what is happening, but it gives off a different vibe to their interaction. So, in this line, Wolves is not saying, I've come to free you, but is directly answering the greeting that Kuro just gave him, the much more familiar, oh, it's been a while, Wolf, it's good to see you. Um, only he's greeting his master in the most formal and deferential way you can possibly have. Something along the line of like, it is an honor to see you again, O master of mine. As such, Wolf doesn't come off as a brusque bodyguard as much as just a perfect servant dedicated to absolute obedience. Which also fit his catchphrase, the Gyoi, which I talk about so much during the video, and that, as I said, means something along the line of your will be done, um, which forces Kuro into the role of this absolute master that he clearly he's used to, but does not seem to really appreciate all that much. The description of Kusabimaru, the name being a combination of linchpin and the general suffix kanji given to names, is translated fairly accurately, with the only big difference being that in Japanese it specifies that Kuro is the divine heir of the dragon lineage. As I say during the video, the word for divine heir here used is Miko, which literally means honorable child and is the title for people like the son of the emperor or Christ the son of God. The sword is also presented as a heirloom of the Hirata family, which is a cadet branch of the Ashina. 
Akade Branch is a house founded by one of the sons of the main family's leader that did not inherit the title of the main family and is then sets off to have their own lands and live in subservience to the main family. So we know that Kuro had connection to this separate family. The Hirata were incidentally also a real minor family that served the Yashina during the Sengoku period, so that checks out. Lastly, I randomly found out that in an early version of the game, the Japanese description for the sword had a different quote associated with it. Um, instead of that about Shinobi needing to kill but never forgetting the importance of mercy, it was something roughly translatable to find a connection to something important as the main reason for the blade, which makes sense with a name like Lynchpin. So next up is our dear Estus equivalent, the Healing Gird. This is a very interesting item and a lot of people have written about it, not because the translation is not accurate, the translation is perfectly fine and works really well, but it's mostly because there is a lot of cultural subtext associated with girds and healing girds in particular. So, first off, girds in general are associated with good luck and happiness in Japanese culture, and one of the eight immortals of Taoism, uh, the so-called Li Tieguai, I have no idea how to pronounce that, um, he possessed a divine gird filled with a special medicine that could heal an injury and never run out. So probably this item is a reference to that mythological um, relic. Secondly, the extraordinary Dr. Dogen, um, mentioned in the description, is likely also a reference to a real-life figure, uh, Dogen Zenji, the founder of the Soto School of Zen. And the name is pronounced in the same way, but it is written in a way that has slightly different meaning. The historical figure uses the kanji for journey and beginning, while Sekiro's Dogen uses those of journey and mysterious or profound, giving off a significantly more occult vibe to the character. All of this information and more was due to Reddit users Sarumaro and Zero LXX, the latter of which also pointed out how the final line in the description was probably a pun in Japanese. For all of that, I left references and links into the description. Uh, it's, it's a good read, so I invite you if you're interested to check them out. So next, I will go quickly over a couple of minor stuff that happens in the second half of the tutorial. Most of the other translations and descriptions and stuff is all pretty accurate and doesn't need much mention. And when it comes f to the little weird man under the bridge and the geckos, I decided to cover them in a later episode when they're going to be more prominent. Um, before we get to the real meat of this discussion, which is going to be Genichiro's boss fight in its entirety. But first, um, the pellets are... Uh, there, there isn't really anything much to talk about in that translation. There are uh, a couple of small interesting tidbits in the kanjis and the historical equivalent to medicinal pellets, and I will leave some links to that in the description. But the only thing I wanted to mention is something that I kind of figured out by myself by translating it, and it's a neat little detail, which is in the last line, uh, in Japanese the more correct translation is something like a pill case full of these pellets was a preferred alternative to a good luck charm when heading into battle, which shows a kind of a pragmatic dry wit from the part of Ashina's warriors, and I think that's cute uh, in a way. The other thing is Mr. Miniboss, the leader Shigenori Yamauchi. His name is nothing particular, like Shigenori is a pretty decent common name for a Japanese person of the time, and Yamauchi is a very common family name. The only thing um, that I think is a little bit interesting is that the, t the English term leader, which is very generic in Japanese, is the more specific term kumigashira, which could mean 
something like it has uh, it is the title of like a village elder and also the title of like a military commander it is the the boss of a small organization um, so nothing extraordinary but it does kind of point at the fact that he probably was just the officer in chief for this particular group of soldiers that we just slaughtered so now we reach Genichiro, the final boss of this tutorial, and the character that gets set up as our main rival right off the bat of this game. Genichiro, there is a lot to talk about with him, mainly because he is the character that has been the most changed by the translation. He's very different in English than how he is in Japanese. But I will start actually by analyzing his arena a little bit, because this place is very interesting, uh, even if we don't have really much of a chance to explore it in detail uh, at this moment, because of a lot of subtextual reasons. Firstly, the fact that it has a lot of these little piles of stones scattered around. Leaving piles of stones scattered around is a funerary practice that is made to help the soul, the soul of the deceased to pass on safely to the other side, which follows the folkloristic belief that children who died before their parents had to construct countless piles of rock on the shores of the river Sanzu, which is very similar to the river Styx in that it is the river that carries souls to the underworld, uh, to atone for the sin of abandoning their filial duty and dying so early. So. The practice of leaving stones behind is made to help in that toil, and there are a lot of stones cut around, together with swords and other weapons impaled into the dust, and these reeds, which are the namesake of the Ashina clan, and have this ghostly, supernatural-looking white appearance, which makes this entire arena like very much looking like a liminal state between like the world of the living and the world of the dead, and also kind of construct these images of the Ashina as a people whose fate and, and the land whose fate is intrinsically linked to strife, mourning, and untimely death. It's a, it's a very poetic place in its own right. Now, moving on to Genichiro proper, let's leave behind the easy stuff first and talk about his name for a short while. So, his name is a combination for the kanji for bowstring and first child for Ichiro, similar to how Kuro was ninth child. And this combination is going to become a little bit more relevant later when we discover his past and his story. Um, it's nothing major, but it is a tiny detail that I quite like to speculate on. Um, but beyond that, the really interesting part is in how his character is, gets across in Japanese regarding to English. He feels very different in Japanese than what the English translation leads to believe. In English, he's much more of a villain character. He's mocking and aggressive, well, not, not aggressive as much as antagonistic towards us, well, in Japanese, he's, um... Well, let, let's get into the translation and you, you'll see better. Immediately, the first difference is in the first thing he says when, in Japanese, his first line is, It's been a while, divine her. Last we saw each other, we were standing together on your uncle's grave. Um, which is similar to what happens in English, the meaning is pretty much the same, but there is a tone of familiarity that in the English subtitles don't really get across, um, where he uses the same formulation that Kuro used with us when we met, that it's been, it's been a while. Uh, so he treats us as we are, like we are a member of his family right off the bat. Now, the second noticeable thing is Kuro's reaction to Genichiro, which even in English is pretty understandable considering his body language and everything, but I still think important to underline that in Japanese he doesn't as much thank us for fighting with Genichiro as much as he apologizes. Um, and being Japanese, the polite language that it is, apologizing to someone to thank them is a perfectly viable 
way of expressing gratitude. It's something like, sorry for leaving the hard work to you, but the fact that the way the scene is directed leaves Kuro's face hidden, I think it implies that the apology is as directed to us as it is directed to Genichiro himself. Then there is Genichiro's final line before fighting us, which in English, as much as I like the formulation of that line in English, it is very much a villainous thing to say, to call us the noble shinobi. Uh, it feels mocking and confrontational. While in Japanese it is much more of a factual, almost resigned statement. So you decide to stand in my way, shinobi of the divine hair. He doesn't call us noble or anything like that, it's just, it, he's just stating what our job is and the fact that we are in his way. And a similar kind of switching tone there is if he defeats us, even if the meaning is the same, he still comments on a lack of skill. While in English it sounds, again, provocative, he's provoking us, in Japanese it is a more factual, so this is as far as a shinobi has to offer, kind of thing. The rivalry with him is still established, so he still very much wants to beat him and feel confrontational, but he does not feel like somebody who is fighting against us because he likes to. And this is stressed even more if you manage somehow to beat him in New Game, or much more easily in New Game Plus, where this alternate cutscene plays. Oh! Shinobio, So, as much as I like this line in English, and I think it conveys pretty much the same meaning, um, it is, in effect, uh, quite different from the Japanese, and it feels, again, much more mocking and villainous of a thing to say. In Japanese, it is a much more simple line. It is, shinobi, don't think of this as cowardice. Which Again, kind of implies that, I, I, it kind of implies that since we are a ninja, we have no right to call what he has done trickery, but it's almost an apology in Japanese. It's almost a, he admits that what he has done is dishonorable and is not teasing us for falling for it as much as it sounds like a person that accepts that he is going to do dishonorable thing, but for an honorable purpose that we still don't really know much about. All in all, to me, Genichiro in Japanese comes off as somebody who is more desperate than villainous. Someone who believes in his own ideals so much as to be determined to be violent and unfair even towards people that he holds no animosity for or that he considers members of his, of his family, if it is for the greater good. And this image is reinforced by the fact that he seems to be someone that Kuro respects and that he feels that he is betraying in his attempt at escape. 
a justified betrayal, but a betrayal nonetheless. Finally, I will conclude with something that is not as climactic as Genichiro, but is still important, and that is going over a little bit of the shinobi prosthetic. The description is fairly accurate, and it reveals to us that the name of our mysterious savior is the sculpture, but in Japanese his name is more specifically that of Bushi, which were artists that specialize in sculpting and carving in the depiction of Buddha. So he's more specifically the sculptor of Buddhas, which is no surprise to anyone, really. Also, the Japanese term used for mechanism in this case is karakuri, which describes the kind of mechanism used in marionettes and automatons and other kinds of simulated humans and stuff like that, uh, with gears and pulleys and strings and cords and so on. Um, which is perfectly intuitable by just looking at the thing, but it's still a, a detail that I find neat, and I like the word karakuri, so I wanted to share that. And that's the end, I think, for this episode. Thank you for having listened until the end. This was a very long video, but I learned a lot while doing it, and I hope you have learned too by listening to me go over interesting fact and translations about Sekiro. Next episode, the next episodes are going to be definitely shorter, going to be focusing on shorter sections of the game, but uh, I still hope that you got something out of it, and that uh, I'll see you in the future.